For the rest of today, I just want to look at some aspects of uh, the fishery sector and to start considering some of the uh, approaches which we take specifically in relation to uh, fish, fishery products and various operations within the supply chain. Uh, so this is the approach we've taken in the manuals to try to divide the supply chain into sections to have uh, an operational manual which looks at fishing vessels, one which looks at uh, establishments for landing and processing fish, uh, another which looks at aquaculture, and then to try and look at one or two key aspects such as uh, traceability uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, other similar uh, functions. Um, so to start this off, uh, I wanted to spend a, a short time looking at uh, fishing vessels and how we ensure food safety conditions uh, during fishing. And of course, as with all aspects of food safety, you start off with structural and equipment uh, requirements. And in this manual here, we have uh, some of the guidelines, which, as I said yesterday, this one on assuring food safety conditions in capture fisheries, uh, there are EU regulations, there are codex, codes of practice, uh, your own national legislation will also say something, I guess, about uh, food safety conditions on uh, fishing vessels. And, and the starting point, of course, comes down to uh, the structure and the equipment which you carry on board. And there are certain principles which you can apply to all fishing vessels, whether they're big vessels or small vessels like this one. Uh, they have to be designed and constructed so as not to allow contamination. Uh, so that means the way in which the vessels are laid out. So we see here, uh, it's not so clear on this one, but this guy who's a conch fisherman and I don't know why he's put the shells here and the conch meat here, but his, this is his fuel tank here. Yeah, so for his outboard motor. So he's got all this conch meat, uh, which is essentially in the same compartment of his vessel as his fuel tank. Uh, so he doesn't quite meet this design and construction uh, to prevent contamination. I mean, I ideally, this, this barrier should have been maybe about here, and he puts the meats here and the shells here would have been a better approach. But anyhow, just an example. Um, so the vessel should be particularly equipped to, to store fishery products in some way, which minimizes the risk of the, them being contaminated. We had a discussion yesterday about the need for ice boxes. And whether you take ice or not, uh, you have to protect the fishery product from, uh, from sources of contamination. And of course, if you do have an ice box and it has a lid and its use is, and it's properly sealed and protected and is designed with smooth, impermeable, corrosion-resistant materials such as fiberglass, uh, which are easy to clean and disinfect, then you have uh, at least a chance of uh, ensuring that the fishery products are going to be brought to shore in, uh, in a safe condition. Uh, so looking at the design of the vessels is, is important. 
uh, <coughs> you have to think about sanitary facilities. You know, it's a fact that fishermen will need to go to the toilet at some time during the journey. It's, it's inevitable. Uh, and you have to actually consider how that's done. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Who's, who's been to sea? All right, put, put your hand up if you've been to sea on a fishing boat. You've been to sea on a fishing boat. Yeah, I, I have as well. So you know what goes on, you know. It's, it's usually, I mean, it's either directly over the side or a bucket and over the side, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but you have to manage this, right? It has to, you know, there has to be some, you have to say something about it. And what we all, what sometimes we say, and what I've said in here, which is more or less in line with EU, is if the journeys are more than 24 hours, then you have to have some kind of flushing water closet system on board. Uh, and facility to wash hands. So, some rules there about structural and equipment requirements. Of course, if the... if it's a larger vessel, if it's a freezer or a factory vessel, uh, then of course you have various facilities. We generally say that freezers should be able to reduce the temperature to minus 18 degrees, uh, but this is not always feasible if it is a tuna vessel freezing in brine, where the brine Minimum temperature is usually, well, very difficult to get brine below about minus 12, but mostly at the strengths which are used commercially, your temperature is about minus 9, minus 10. So it shouldn't be any higher than that. Uh, but either way, your storage should be at minus 18 or less. Uh, we say that cold storage areas should have temperature recording devices. Uh, not enough just to have a thermometer which indicates the temperature. Uh, according to the, the EU requirements the, in the EU legislation, uh, it, it requires actual a record of the temperature to be kept, to be made and kept. Uh, interestingly enough though, uh, that's how we've always interpreted it. Uh, however, the European Commission, uh, you'll all know that they make inspections uh, from the Food and Veterinary Office of DG uh, Sante, some of you have received those missions at various stages. Um, but they also visit EU member states. It's not just for uh, countries which are exporting the EU. The primary work of those inspectors is to make sure that in the 27 EU member states that they are all complying with the EU uh, legal requirements and responsibilities. And they just recently uh, conducted an inspection of the uh, food safety of fishery product controls in the United Kingdom. And what was very interesting and rather surprising to me is in the UK, many of the freezer vessels did not have these uh, temperature recording devices. And it was noted by the Commission and the UK basically said, no, we're not going to do it. We interpret this as requiring that a temperature record is maintained. And it is sufficient 
for uh, somebody to note the temperature periodically and that is what we require them to do so very interesting if you're expecting the EU to come down and inspect your freezer vessels uh, you may wish to uh, consider anyhow uh, using this case of the UK to uh, uh, <laughs> to quote to them if they raise the issue that you don't have temperature recorders on board uh, it, it's a bit of a nerdy thing but I, I tend to read all of these uh, reports published by the Commission and it's very interesting to see uh, how they uh, approach these these things uh, okay on larger vessels as well you have to have some kind of pest control system and you have to have a system for hygienic control and since 2004 you need a HACCP plan on freezer vessels and factory vessels. Everybody here is familiar with HACCP? Yes. Yeah? Um, on freezer vessels and factory vessels but obviously not on vessels like this. <laughs> It would. But you can apply HACCP principles, you know. And actually, uh, actually, when you read EU law, EU legislation does not require a HACCP plan, a HACCP plan per se. The wording is such that it requires a system of controls based on HACCP principles and you know that was a compromise in the wording uh, because uh, of the potential impact of requiring small operators and restaurants and uh, shops all of which are food establishments according to the law uh, to actually require them all to have formal uh, HACCP plans was considered to be too much of a burden, a regulatory burden on the food sector and therefore the requirement was softened to say okay but you must have some controls based on HACCP principles. They did, they did in the old 9-1 493 yeah uh, I mean we always interpreted own checks as as, ha as HACCP uh, I don't think it's used anywhere at the moment uh, I think it says uh, I, I think they use the term internal controls now rather than uh, own checks but I'll, I'll check that for you because it's uh, an interesting point. Um, so HACCP, HACCP plan essentially and then additional conditions for factory vessels. You see what I've done in this document is follow the structure of the EU requirements which I think is very sensible actually. They say these are the basic requirements for all vessels. Then if it is a freezer vessel there are a freezer or a factory vessel there is another layer of requirements on top and then if it is a factory vessel there is an additional layer of requirements so factory vessels are defined as those vessels where fishery products undergo processes such as uh, filleting, slicing, skinning, shelling shucking, mincing or processing that's the EU definition and basically what it's saying is that if there is some uh, cutting or interference in the integrity of the 
fish or the animal concerned such that contamination could be introduced into it then that is considered to be a processing step and the vessel is defined as a uh, factory vessel. He's, he's a factory vessel, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. Interesting point, because he is shucking his products. It's removing them from the shell. And therefore, according to the EU definition, this is a factory vessel. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting one. Uh, and, okay, there's only one country in, uh, in the region which is able to export conch to the EU, which is Jamaica. And I don't know if this point has ever been raised by the inspectors. Therefore, these vas vessels uh, should be considered as fact factory vessels, even though they're small vessels. Well, there are, there are, because it says followed by wrapping and packaging, okay? So, providing that there's no packaging involved, and I think this is the get-out clause, you see, the EU definition says, on board fish, which fishery products undergo one or more of the following operations followed by wrapping or packaging, and, if necessary, chilling or freezing. So, providing you shuck, but don't pack in any way. So, I think, I think that is the saving grace for this guy, that he's not undergoing any packaging. Uh, then he can claim that he's not a, a factory vessel. So, additional conditions for factory vessels, they have to have your hand washing facilities with non-hand operable taps. System, a system for hygienic disposal of waste and separate storage for packaging materials. So these are the key differences which distinguish a factory vessel from a processing vessel in terms of, uh, in, from a freezer vessel in terms of the uh, equipment uh, requirements. Okay, handling on board protect from contamination and from the sun or any other sources of heat. Uh, water which is used on board and that includes ice uh, should be either potable water or clean sea water or if it's a fresh water fishery clean fresh water. So that for uh, washing of fish which has undergone those activities <coughs> including the shucking of glass gastropod mollusks right you have to use potable water only potable water can be used on fish which has been sliced filleted skinned cut in some way you can use the seawater for using ice with whole or eviscerated fish, for washing of whole fish, for washing of eviscerated fish or deheaded fish, and the washing of equipment and things like that, and the deck. I mean, the seawater is infinitely variable in salinities and salts, different salts and all, all sorts of things. So you can't standardize it as such, which is why they don't, they don't bother. But what they do is limit the uses to those which, from experience, they know have not caused any problems. Uh, so, of course, potable water is, is defined, and only potable water for certain, the, certain activities. Uh, so, I mean, w maybe we can get our fishermen, our conch fishermen, uh, to say he should be washing his, his <coughs> conch in uh, potable water. But the key thing is, and the, the biggest crime we ever see in this area, is when 
you know, typically the fishing boat, it's discharged its catch and then the bucket goes in the harbour water and <laughs> that's what they use to wash the de deck down. And that's, that's the biggest crime that we, we see on a very, very regular basis. So, so that's the thing that we need to look out for, really. Uh, so that's water. We'll talk more about water later uh, today. Um, so making sure we use the right water is important. Uh, if we eviscerate the fish, it should be eviscerated as soon as possible and the viscera discarded or kept separately. And surfaces and equipment which are in contact with fish, of course, should be kept clean and sanitized periodically. So they're the key features of uh, handling on board. Okay, water supply we uh, mentioned. Uh, handling of fish with potential to produce histamine, as we said yesterday, uh, this calls for special additional activities in terms of handling to make sure that if there is going to be an extended period at sea beyond a few hours that we uh, put sufficient uh, ice or uh, chill the fish in or freeze it in some other way. And these are the species which might be implicated. Well also your histamine is going to be produced uh, more rapidly or earlier in those areas which are adjacent to areas where spoilage starts in terms of you know the belly flaps and the the round the gills and things like that because that's where you have higher levels of bacter naturally present bacteria which then start working when the fish is is, is dead but uh, this issue of the flying fish because I, I had a look in the literature and I couldn't find any studies and it is something we need to know because it is a uh, an important uh, species in this region and it would seem to have some similarities to some of the other uh, fish which are histamine producers but until somebody does the science of controlled spoilage and uh, measures these, uh, these variables we don't know if the hazard <coughs> is, is associated with it. Um, so, yeah, handling of these species requires special attention. So, very important if you are an inspector controlling vessels which are catching, targeting these species that we uh, uh, take care to ensure that they have appropriate temperature controls. And these are the criteria which are set by the FDA. The EU doesn't have specific temperature targets. Uh, these are set by the FDA in the Fishery Products Hazards and Control Guide. They're not regulatory targets but they are uh, the conditions which are advisable to employ as part of your HACCP plan. And what they say, and this is all based on scientific studies, looking at the rates of histamine development under different circumstances, that if the, you should have chilling of the fish immediately after harvest, and in other words, we use as evidence of that the fact that they are landed with ice, in circumstances where uh, the ambient temperature is more than 28 degrees and the trip is longer than six hours. So in other words, if the trip is only five hours, then you don't need to take any ice. It's not a requirement. You can get away with it. Um, if the ambient temperature is less than 28 degrees and the trip is nine hours or longer, you should take ice. So if the temperature is less than 28, you can 
be at sea for up to nine hours without ice. But if you catch large tuna above 10 kilograms, uh, these should be chilled to an internal temperature of 10 degrees or less within six hours of death. So these are the conditions which are established as the critical conditions to be applied in a HACCP plan concerning uh, fish which are histamine producers. And that uh, as inspectors you should be able to confirm that these conditions are, are met. And yeah, as we said yesterday, you have to know when the vessel goes. But usually, often, there, I wouldn't say in all circumstances, but a harbour authority, a port authority, will record the departure of a vessel and the uh, retine of a vessel. Yeah. No. Not a small vessel. Yeah. So they just go and come as they please. And that's the reason why you just... Yeah. You must have ice. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, uh, then of course, uh, personal hygiene on fishing vessels, difficult to do very much, but of course, there's, as far as possible, uh, clean clothing and footwear, ensure hand wounds are properly covered with a waterproof dressing uh, don't spit or smoke or eat whilst directly handling fishery products and wash your hands after uh, going to the toilet uh, again you can use seawater but hand washing is a good thing to encourage and then keeping the vessel clean and sanitized all surfaces and equipment should be cleaned down at least every day and after every landing event washing with potable water or clean sea water and a detergent that removes all of the gross contamination and then uh, sanitizing with a suitable agent. Bleach is a, is a good one. We'll talk a little bit more later about the use of sodium hypochlorite at uh, concentrations of between 50 and 100 parts per million, uh, which is equivalent to about 5 to 10 mils of a standard household bleach in 10 liters of water and to use that as a uh, sanitizing liquid which you then put on the deck or the equipment, the fish boxes, the ice box and then leave for a contact time. And then of course official controls. Uh, what we have to do as inspectors from the competent authority, inspect our vessels uh, bearing in mind that these may also be industrial vessels which are flagged by our registration authority so they may not be calling into our ports and a number of countries in this region do flag uh, vessels from uh, which are owned by nationals of other countries uh, so be aware that uh, from a from the point of view of sanitary regulations the nationality of the vessel is determined by its flag and as the competent authority you are responsible for vessels which are flagged by your country even though they may not be visiting your ports so this is a this is an issue for countries such as Belize, for example. Belize has a... Uh, don't you, Nesta, you have various vessels which are uh, from Spain or Portugal which are carrying the Belizean flag. Uh, I don't know if anyone... St. Vincent. Vincent has several vessels. Yeah, 34 to be exact. 34, really, okay. Uh, I know that uh, Trinidad also flags a number of vessels. I think um, well in, in that example, 
Trinidad is able to port for St. Vincent. Right, so our vessels, they land their fish in, um, in, tri in Trinidad. So they don't okay. necessarily come to our port. Okay. They go to Trinidad. All right. Yeah. But nonetheless, the responsibility is still flat state, still St. Vincent. Exactly, exactly. So you have to make sure that you have arrangements in place for the inspection of those, of those vessels and it's not always easy. You may have to move your inspectors to another country to where the vessels are uh, or make some kind of reciprocal arrangements with uh, authorities in those, in those countries. Uh, so these are uh, sometimes they fall within the gaps and uh, we find that some vessels are not under effective sanitary uh, controls. Uh, then also you may sometimes as an authority conversely be asked to inspect foreign flagged vessels which are visiting your port. Uh, for various reasons you may be asked by their flag state competent authority or if they are discharging their products to a shore-based establishment which is subsequently going to export to the EU you will be asked to issue a certificate as the competent authority of the country of dispatch okay it's not the country of origin it's the country of dispatch and as part of that certificate you have to attest that if it's the EU that the product was produced in accordance with regulations so and so and so and so now how are you going to check that if the vessel is not one which is flagged to your country you don't have direct responsibility over that vessel but if it has discharged in your country you may wish to inspect it so that you can certify accordingly uh, or you may wish to have some communication with the flag state competent authority regarding the conditions on board that vessel Uh, well, well ge generally these are uh, port health regulations are to do with uh, well generally two things one is whether there are any disease conditions on board which can transmit to your territory and also the uh, health and hygiene conditions of the of the crew uh, they are separate to well, separate to the food safety conditions on fishing vessels. Now, depending on how you organize your institutional arrangements, sometimes you, in some countries, you have uh, port health officers are given the job of inspecting the hygiene conditions on board food, uh, on board fishery vessels, fishing vessels. And that's okay. Uh, you know they're under the supervision of the competent authority but it's not always the case sometimes port health authorities inspect their thing and sometimes you have your food safety or competent authority inspecting for for their conditions uh, <coughs> and then just to mention also this uh, other issue which since many of you are from fisheries departments you will be involved also in the IUU certification uh, which is nothing to do with food safety but which is uh, designed to ensure that where fishery products are consigned to the European Union that they have been caught in accordance with the uh, existing rules and obligations applicable to the country which is exporting them to the EU 
so there is an additional certification requirement there. And of course this then becomes, uh, it's a parallel certification in many cases because what we're trying to do with the IUU certification is certify the origin, that the vessel from which it comes is properly licensed, that it is operated in accordance with the rules, that it has made the catch declarations, it's completed the logbook, it's fished with the right gears and fished in the right areas and all of these things. And ensuring that the vessel origin is correct for the IUU certification is often the same set of steps you would want to take to ensure that the sanitary origin of the product was also uh, correctly described on the export certificates. So one of the things that uh, sometimes happens is if these things are both within the same uh, department, within the fisheries department mandate, you can have both of these kind of certifications integrated using the same data. Uh, it becomes more complicated when the competent authority is a food safety body or a Ministry of Health which has one certification and another separate certification from the fisheries department for the IUU. And in those circumstances often we see different inspectors uh, uh, boarding a vessel when it's entering port or discharging uh, one set to look at the sanitary aspects and then followed by another set to look at the IUU aspects. Uh, so where you can you may be able to find some kind of way of uh, making these processes more efficient by combining these activities. Okay, so that's, uh, that's fishing vessels. Any, any other questions on that? Okay.